I jumped out of the frying pan into the fire about 1980. And uh, I was in construction, doing gunite work, concrete work, helped build a spec house or two. And then uh, in 1980, I decided to, to build a house upon the ranch that my dad owned. And he gave me half the ranch for working hard when I was a kid on the ranch that I grew up on. So I had a couple hundred acres and decided it was time to move up there and cut some trees and make some lumber with Dad. <laughs> Dad was a rancher. A rancher. <laughs> but kind of a jack of all trades. He, he hauled, in California where we moved from Sacramento area, he hauled uh, dredge tailings for gravel, for driveways. He farmed, he milked cows, he had a wrecking yard and hauled and sold a lot of scrap iron. He did everything. You learned a lot from him, I'll bet. I learned a lot. I learned how to improvise, overcome, and adapt. From the time I was eight years old, I mean, I was out of bed at six and on out, out doing whatever Dad was doing at seven every day until school started. Looking forward to summer and looking forward to weekends. A real work ethic. Definitely a work ethic. German. German and Swede, but I think the German, the stubborn German, I think comes out more than anything. <laughs> you know, you know what my dad said? My dad is 87. And a couple years, no, about five years ago, I said, Dad, why don't you take this map, draw some lines on it, go paint some trees, and I'll cut them down and harvest them and do all the hard work. And he says, damn it, I was born to work. And I tell you, that pretty much sums it up. It just feels rewarding to look behind you and see what you've accomplished for the day. Especially if you're, once you know who you are and what, why you're doing what you do and the end result and you know the result 50 years from now or more, yeah. depending on who, who takes the next step. Yeah. So it's pretty rewarding work and where I'm going to take you up here and show you a, one little spot just because I think better in my pickup when I'm driving because I do so much of it. it kind of shows the kind of work we do that's a little different than just harvest, replant, and go again. So we're, we're kind of into the ecological world. Um, and we see the need for it too, and we see the demand for it. So we're just trying to make it pay the, way, the bills while we do it. Yeah, <clears throat> one thing about our world, nothing ever stays the same. Not us. And if you're working hard and learning and growing and building a reputation and really digging into your enterprise, you know, it creates opportunities. You have to adapt with the change or not. So, I think probably I have changed. Of course, the high-tech world has changed. The uh, ability to produce more with less people has changed dramatically. But maybe, at times, to the detriment of the environment. So, we are still leaning a little more towards harvesting where it's a lot more work, but the soil, the root systems, the soil food web, the plants don't take such a big hit. Uh, we do the best we can given meeting all the parameters of the job. Yeah. We may, if we had to compete in the industrial logging world, we'd probably find it pretty difficult to get work, except that people like us, I don't know, I never look for work, it always just finds me. And that's, I mean, I've been, every year I worry about not having work, and every year I can't quite get it all done. We have a crew of, uh, let's see, today I have three contract people that are running equipment because it's going to snow a lot real soon and we won't get that job done. 
and I don't want to let that young couple down. So I kind of put getting the job done ahead of profit, uh, knowing it'll come back someday one way or the other. So uh, I have six guys, counting myself, uh, five trucks, and another contractor with two of his guys there, him and two other guys. So there's like 12 or 14 people involved in this project today. That's big. Yeah, kind of a tough little project. It's all steep and everything is uphill to the main road to get out, to get off the job. What are the other factors that make a job harder or easier? The quality of the timber, the height, the size, the, the defect, rocky ground, steep ground, brush. <laughs> There's brush all over this. You can't walk it. You have to open up all the old trails with the cat just so you can get where you want to go and look around. The snows, we have to probably walk our equipment, you know, two and a half miles an hour for eight or nine miles wow. to get it off the job. There's a lot, I mean, we could talk for days about that. No, uh, you know, nobody knows your little, your little world. Nobody knows what you bump into, all the hurdles you have to cross to put a, put a written project together. We're the, we're the same way. There's millions of little idiosyncrasies in our world that until you're there, you never think about. Well, this is a really interesting piece of property. We worked on it for probably 20 years, on and off. Marty Main is the consulting forester, and Judd Parsons and the family was the owner. Well, yeah, the, was the owner. Hillcrest Orchards was the owner family, there's like 40 or 50 voting members, some of them as young as five or six years old, that vote on decisions on how to run this business, Hillcrest Orchards. So uh, they voted to sell this property. Judd, Judd his brother, uh, maybe a sister and a nephew bought it back being the leaders that they are. And now they're forming a conservation easement on it. It's like, it's over 2,000 acres, I believe. So Pacific Trust out of San Francisco is putting together a conservation easement for the property. And uh, it'll preserve, nobody will be able to come in and just an annihilate the value out of the resources and leave. So it'll always be managed for water, for timber, for wildlife, for uh, all the ecological things, for fire. Uh, but it won't ever be taken advantage of. So it's kind of cool. I see this, I've been watching this process for three years. And I think I see that Judd and his three or four siblings uh, are going to come out making just as much money as if they would have harvested the timber for doing the right thing for the right reasons and having the confidence to make a stand and, and, and move that direction. It takes some real leadership to do that. Because it's, uh, I'm sure, I mean, I don't know, but I'm sure it's in the millions of dollars kind of a deal. So tell me what your role is in this. You know, I am just a worker. I'm just labor. So Marty recruits us and others, but typically we've been involved quite a bit in the uh, harvest of the timber. So it's it's got some little challenges, wide variety of timber, tough roads, um, and it's never a clear cut. Sometimes it's really thick when we finish. Sometimes there's a little bit more room between the trees. Helps us immensely. And we never take all the big ones. We take a big one or two a day, maybe. So we, we harvest a wide variety of age and size and species. 
opinion on the conditions, the slope, the uh, the uh, climate change, and how fast it's changing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a lot of science in, involved, a lot of planning. There's a lot of science and a huge amount of planning. All the available science and a huge amount of planning. So this whole hillside that we've been driving by, we, we've logged. When you're at Callahan's looking across the freeway, you look right at it. And this time of year with all the black oaks, they're turning colors, their leaves are about gone now, but it's really pretty. And you can't tell we've been in there. Marty always says, all things considered, I would like to do this. So, <laughs> you know, he considers every aspect the needs of the owners, the needs of the land, the, the changing climate for sure. Um, fire is huge. You know, the fire equation is a large part of his decisions and his planning, especially in key areas. Um, because this property runs over the top of the Mount Ashton Road to the Colstein Road and across the Colstein Road, all the way back almost to Ashland. So the way it lays, it can be a fire, a an opportunity to stop a catastrophic fire. That's about the best you can do with fire planning. It's an opportunity. And so, yeah, and Marty has a pretty high degree in fire. So he understands what he needs to do to make it work. You can't fight nature. This ground, these high elevation mountains grow timber and you, it's hard to get rid of. It always wants to go back to being timber. Um, except with the case of fire, then it'll be timber in succession. Grass, brush, back to timber. Grass, brush, back to timber. It's just nature's way and the site is suited to do that. We logged a little bit right in here last March. I think it was a year ago March and what a challenge. Anyway, Marty always makes us work hard. Over the, over the course of this whole property, there's hardwood patches, there's brush patches, there's aspens and wetlands. Um, there's some mature trees. I mean, these trees aren't completely mature, but they're considered mature for this day and age. They're all, every tree here probably is over 100 years old. So we have Douglas fir in this stand, that one with the witch's broom. Another one over there, that's 170 foot tall tree and then we have ponderosa pines right here so the pines in this area especially this close to hill was, was all harvested back in the days when everything was shipped in a wooden box so fruit growers had their own mill and they made wooden boxes and they loved pine especially sugar pine and ponderosa pine so part of our job as we go through these forests is to lean them back towards a more natural state. Pine, ponderosa pine especially, Less. susceptible to drought and they're, they're going to handle this climate change better than some other species. So Marty always protects the pine pushes back to white fir, which is a shade tolerant species that comes in underneath the stand that hasn't had fire in years, and also manages the dug fir for long term. So dug fir, ponderosa, and sugar pine we always push just because it's a novelty. We actually work diligently to protect the black oaks and some white oaks on this property because we want to mix in that, uh, that species as well. So we, we look for ones that we think will survive and we give them room to grow. Sun on the south side. So pine, oaks, a little less dug fir, push the white fir back and you start to get back more towards a natural system where fire would have entered on a 10 year regime historically at this elevation. And, and then madrone. We see tons of madrone trees these days but Historically, uh, you wouldn't see nearly as many because of the little orange, pretty little orange bark. Very thin and very wet and very susceptible to fire. So when we lay out, when we, when Marty lays out a unit, 
and plans what he wants to do with that unit. There is a lot involved to get the long-term end result that's going to benefit society. bark and it's kind of yellow and when you cut them they're just it's just waxy and beautiful it's great wood but I kind of hate cutting a big tree anymore hard work you know the I have two guys that jump over that bank in March in snow and rain and sleet and set chokers they're laying on the ground they're in the brush their faces in the brush it's raining it's wet it's tough and uh, so I compete with knife age uh, the labor unions that pay good money have everybody has benefits we have to uh, find good people treat them fairly and still have a profit in the timber left for the landowner mm -hmm. and that's a challenge you know the timber crop gets amortized out like over probably it would be like 80 years so you have to carry three or four percent so it's really not the profit in it that you would think there is if you are honest about the numbers the biggest thing is that people never think about every Everything up there is kinetic energy. Everything up there wants to hit the ground. Everything over your head, by nature, wants to fall to the ground. And whether we're working there or not, it happens. So I've had, uh, and a friend of mine's have had snags fall just for no reason. No wind, it's just time. Right close to where you're walking or working and stuff. So that's probably falling objects, whether we create the incident or nature creates it is probably our biggest risk out here. Um, equipment, yeah, I, I'm after the guys keep seat belts fastened, work within your limits. Uh, things can happen, all right. But for the most part, we're not too bad. Who I influence, I hope the greatest opportunity is a few people that we influenced in the right direction long-term that care I think that's the most power education sharing the passion sharing the knowledge you know I can be I can be pretty influential out here walking through the woods with the right young man you know digging around looking at mushroom sided and then and then I hope that it follows through you did that with your son didn't you I think so I think so they get a little frustrated at times because what we do is so much work. But I think they've kind of, I think they can see it. And that doesn't happen quick to see what's really going on and what has gone <clears throat> on over the last 250 years. But once you see it, you kind of go, oh my gosh. So, you know, after 35 years of just being in the forest, I mean, I've worked outside since I was a kid. I mean, like six, seven, eight, I've been outside and always worked outside, whether it's construction, military, logging. Uh, you just get to where you understand things so well. And I, one of the things I have become extremely aware of is that I will say something to somebody and they don't have a clue about what I just said, even though it's in plain English. They don't see it, they don't understand it, they don't know what's going on all around them all the time. So I kind of see <clears throat> the whole world getting themselves into a corner, really with the climate change issue, because they don't see the hotter days, they don't see the trees dying, the change in the forest like I see and the accentuating curve that's happening in the forest over the last 20 years, they don't see it. They just jump in their car and turn on the air conditioning, go home, turn on the air conditioning, uh, just enjoy life. 
so that has me a little concerned for like my grandkids as kids or something to that effect you have to observe and especially like with my sheep sometimes I'll just go sit right in the middle of them and just watch to see what they're doing how what they're eating how they're eating it how they feel you know and the same thing in the forest too you just have to really stop and think about it a while you have to take time to evaluate and then it all comes to light well not all <clears throat> it's a never-ending learning process but it sure is fun